It is not always obvious what is true and should be believed. A news headline makes some bold statement, which if anyone bothered to read the article would be utterly discredited by what is said in paragraph 5. We see a photograph or a video online and the caption lies about its content. For an hour or a few days the world believes something untrue. A subset of the population will always believe it. A politician is reported to have said such and such. A video of a bomb blast is not from Ukraine, but from some other event five years earlier. Someone giving a quote of someone else is cropped out and blamed for having authored the statement being quoted. Everything is stripped of its context and is thus made useful for propaganda or clickbait, a means to sell war bonds or vitamin supplements or ideological division. This is the great failure of postmodernism. The truth, if it even exists, doesn't matter. Everything and everyone is a commodity to be exploited. God is dead and we have killed him. That was Nietzsche's warning. Well, if it had stopped at the notion of an old man in the clouds, then fine. But now the deepest values of humanity, truth and justice, are being killed too. A long time ago, people told stories to transmit deep and important ideas of value. The stories they told turn out to be entirely wrong, but that doesn't imply anything about the ideas of value. Everything might yet rest upon those ideas. Maybe the stories of ancient people provide false answers, but the questions of who we are and what we should do about it are as valid as ever. Resist the urge to transmit falsehood in the service of your beliefs. Say, for example, that you are right, that a certain politician is a son of a bitch and should be thrown out of office. A piece of misinformed propaganda that will hurt the politician in the immediate term will then be discovered to be a lie and will bolster rather than diminish that politician's capital. Instead, your credibility will be damaged, perhaps irreversibly. Let the truth do the work, and you cannot go wrong. But you must accept whatever your belief that the facts as they unravel might end up undermining your position. If that is the case, then you will have to go down with your belief, like the captain of a sinking ship, or get off the deck onto the lifeboat of truth. I get it. This is a considerable loss. A rubber dinghy is no replacement for a mighty frigate. But if your compass faces toward true north, you are sailing in the right direction. You only believe what you believe because you think it is true. What the hell good is a false belief, as good as a contract with the devil? You can play a fine guitar, but you'll be doing so on the deck of the Titanic. You can be wrong now, but right later, or you can cling to the erroneous beliefs you hold today. And the same applies to me. This episode is a consideration of what we can ultimately know. Are we sane in an insane world or insane in a sane one? Perhaps the central insight of the temporally integrated causality landscape is that the world as we know it is inside out. Everything we observe by any means at all is content within consciousness, always. The conscious mind is a container. It is necessarily of larger dimensions than the percepts themselves. No matter how immense or how loud something is, it falls within the mind's domain. It is only by comparing the magnitude of contents that we infer the character of objective things. Recognizing this, I developed a neuroscientific framework consisting of a large system capable of witnessing the dynamics of its own smaller subsystems. Maybe I went too far and got too specific about things like temporal continuity and relational meaning. Maybe I spoke too soon about structures of integrated causality. It's possible that these details obscure the key and undeniable insight of something large containing many smaller somethings. The point is so subtle, so unflinchingly true that it might be passed over, so I'm going to try to drive it home in this episode. Let's go back to Descartes and see if we can find out where the confusion comes from. In effect, Descartes observed that he must exist because he is experiencing content. Thus he inferred himself from the content which he directly witnessed. He did not directly witness himself, he directly witnessed sensations and thoughts, so he was right to doubt the authenticity of worldly things. Thoughts exist, sensations exist, that is certain. I have thoughts and sensations, therefore I must exist. That is the philosophical move. I respect that move, though to be intellectually honest we have to see that a move has been made, an inference has been drawn. There is a thought, whatever that is, true or false, however weird the world is that makes such a thing possible, 
the existence of that thought occurring now is the only thing which cannot be doubted. In contrast to any suggestion that consciousness is an illusion, it is self-evident that conscious content is the only thing which could not possibly be an illusion. Here I am. I'm contemplating the universe. Let's start at the very bottom. What do I have? What can I claim to exist? Contents. Period. Given that, what can I hope to learn? Well, I can learn how the contents interact with one another, how to make contents, contents appear and disappear. I can discover the regularities which give rise to contents or which change their character. This is empiricism, and it has allowed us to bootstrap our way to a huge body of knowledge. Is the body of knowledge real? Does it tell us the truth about things? Well, the knowledge is at least reliable. We make predictions according to that knowledge, and the predictions work. When they don't, we re-examine the knowledge and make corrections. What does this prove? I can think of two distinct possibilities. Either the objective world operates according to the facts and rules we discover empirically, or we are all insane in the same way, so we all think the world operates in the way we understand. Or, I suppose we might allow a bit from column A and a bit from column B. Possibility A says that the data tell the truth about the objective world. Five researchers stand there with clipboards. A man enters the laboratory wearing a blue hat. The researchers take notes, subsequently compare them, and it is agreed unanimously that a man in a blue hat really was there. If this is correct, then we are happy with possibility A. That which we have seen or heard or whatever is objectively real. Possibility B says that we are all insane or confused in the same direction. Five researchers all record seeing a man in a blue hat, but there was never any such man in the room. If no man had shown up in no blue hat, but the five all agree unanimously that he did, then we are living in possibility B. It needn't be the appearance of a man in a blue hat which is being considered. It could be a white precipitate forming in a test tube, or the boiling of a fluid in an Erlenmeyer flask. It could be the reading on a digital thermometer. What we consider to be a hallucination is something that one person sees, hears, or otherwise detects, while others do not. Obviously, this is a useful heuristic. That kind of situation implies that what is happening in the hallucinator's brain, and therefore mind, is of a different kind than what is happening in a normal brain, and therefore mind. When you and I agree about things that happen in our shared environment, we agree to the intuitive inference expressed by possibility A. Something exists in our objective vicinity, and we both detect its nature. This is an inference, not an indubitable truth. Descartes' inference is even deeper than this. Descartes infers that he exists. Philosophically, his inference is on stronger ground than ours is. In the following passage from Descartes' Meditations, he considers the veracity of things which he perceives. Descartes writes, quote, All that I have up to this moment, except that it is possessed of the highest truth and certainty, I received either from or through the senses. I observed, however, that these sometimes misled us, and it is the part of prudence not to play at place absolute confidence in that by which we have even once been deceived. But it may be said, perhaps, that although the senses occasionally mislead us respecting minute objects, and such and so far removed from us as to be beyond the reach of close observation, there are yet many other of their informations, presentations of the truth, of which it is manifestly impossible to doubt, as, for example, that I am in this place, seated by the fire, clothed in a winter dressing gown, that I hold in my hands this piece of paper, with other intimations of the same nature. But how could I deny that I possess these hands and this body, and withal escape from being classed with persons in a state of insanity, whose brains are so discorded and clouded by a dark bilious vapors as to cause them pertinaciously to assert that they are monarchs when they are in the greatest poverty, or clothed in gold and purple when destitute of any covering, or that their head is made of clay, their body of glass, or that they are gourds? I should certainly be not less insane than they were I to regulate my procedure according to examples so extravagant. Though this be true, I must nevertheless here consider that I am a man, and that consequently I am in the habit of sleeping, and representing to myself in dreams those same things, or even sometimes others less probable, which the insane think are presented to them in their waking moments." Unquote. First I should note that Descartes doubles down on his first inference, to say that he represents to himself in his dreams. This is a natural way of phrasing what he means, but at the same time it implies that he is making the dreams for himself. This is the same as saying, I think, which carries along a major assumption when compared to the statement, I have thoughts, or thoughts occur to me, or perhaps even, there are these thoughts. Thoughts exist. 
perceptions exist. Yes. Therefore, I that have thoughts must exist. That is the inference. Surely Descartes' brain produces thoughts and dreams and so on, but Descartes himself has room to doubt that he and the brain or body are identical things, and we have room to doubt it too. We don't really know where our thoughts come from, and we don't have the power to hear a sound at will or see by choice something vividly appear before us. We assume that our sense of willfulness, as occurs in voluntary movement and speech, is due to the actual operation of our will. Yet notice that you do not strictly know how you speak or move or shift the focus of your attention. Secondly, Descartes makes the observation that people are considered insane when they think things about themselves or their environment which are not true. So, to put our conundrum in a certain light, we might ask, are we all sane or are we all insane by the metric of perceiving what is really there? In terms of psychology, we would be described as sane to the degree that we understand and perceive things as normal. Well, normalized to what? Not reality, not objectivity, apparently normalized to the healthy average of human beings. Suppose that normal, healthy human beings are all insane in precisely the same way relative to reality. By definition, we are not insane relative to one another. We all agreed, did we not, that a man in a blue hat entered the lab? Well, what do we mean the hat is blue? Blue is not a thing in the real world but a qualitative tint composed of consciousness. We have not inferred the blueness of the hat, we have known it directly. If four out of our five observers agree that it is blue, we shall impugn the credibility or the perceptivity of the other one who says that it is green. He is the insane one, not us. And yet if a race of aliens were to add five of their number to our study, they might, all five, agree that the hat is undeniably green and thereby outnumber our four earthlings who saw blue. We might query the objective world given this impasse and measure the wavelengths of the light which is reflected from the hat, but these data will give us no information about which color we should expect to see, since color is a product of mind and not of photons. The alien mind is no less reliable than ours for discriminating features of the objective world. In the course of our evolution, solutions to our perceptive needs have been selected on the basis of survival and reproductive success. The visual brain has been configured by natural selection. That configuration determines the character of our conscious experiences, not the incoming streams of physical data from the environment. Potato chips taste good, and microchips taste bad, though both can provide a crunchy mouthfeel. This is not a statement about potato chips and microchips. It is a statement about consciousness and the evolved structure of the nervous system. Not a bad system for producing adaptive behavior in the environment, unless, of course, the environment contains a bottle of antifreeze. I've heard this stuff tastes quite tolerable, but I've also heard that it is viciously poisonous. It would thus be quite insane to drink the stuff. Consider the process that a baby makes in learning to evaluate its world and maneuver its body parts. The baby doesn't know anything about muscles and nerves or motor neurons. It just has sensations and an apparent capacity to clumsily alter them. You came into being by unknown means, in any case unknown and unremembered by you. You began to have visual and auditory and gustatory experiences. You liked some things, you didn't like others. You began to put together a set of expectations and connections between your perceptions. Nothing new in kind has been added to your arsenal in the subsequent years. With experience, you built up an inventory of knowledge about the way things look and feel, how they can be used to alter your sensations. You became skilled at doing this. You remember these skills, or at least it seems as though you do. You remember previous episodes, or at least it seems that way. You learned to interpret sounds as communications, and piece by piece you formulated a linguistic system. From where you are situated now, I can ask you then, what are you? You will tell me a whole lot of things that you infer about what you are. You can say, I'm a human person, alive on planet Earth, about such and such length of time, and so on. But none of that is first-hand knowledge. You are not using a primary source. You are telling me a lot of beliefs that you've come to hold. They are beliefs about an objective you. I'm not saying your beliefs are without merit. I'm just pointing out that they are beliefs. When you awaken from a dream, you find that you have just believed a great many things which are quickly dispelled and forgotten. You don't know what you are in objective reality. You only know that you have a subjective reality. All the things that have occurred in your experience have done so inside of it. According to the temporally integrated causality landscape, you are a system of causal relations which experiences subsystems of causal relations which occur within you. 
The way in which this system is organized composes a tapestry of qualitative experiences in accordance with internal changes taking place. As soon as there are sufficient changes, you immediately experience them. The illusion they create is of an outside world, with you, a moving body, contained inside of it. But the reverse is true. The body, with all its pieces and parts, is only a part of the system. If those parts of the system are removed, you will still exist, but you will no longer know a body or its parts. In truth, you feel as though you are a small part of a larger world. What is the extension of your body in comparison to the extension of space which you perceive yourself to walk around in? All of it, the space around you, the clouds and trees and distant stars are all within your subjective world. They are all within the mind, within you. This, I think, is why the ego dies in psychedelic experiences. You come to see that you are not the body in the midst of an environment, but the whole environment, too. Your body is just one small piece. All of it is in one unified mind. Extend your hand in front of your face. The thing you see, which you know as your hand, is not outside of you, nor is the space through which you pass it. A correct framing of the conscious mind must incorporate this understanding. Integrated causality is a physical phenomenon occurring on a physical substrate, the thalamocortical brain. That is the thing in the objective universe that assembles the system of causal relations. You are not the thalamocortical brain, though. If you are anything at all, you are the integrated structure of causality. The TICL framework holds that you can sense the geometric meaning of causal structures internal to yourself. Consider this little experiment. Allow me to open your skull and carefully remove your brain. I'll take care to bring the eyes out along with the rest of the preparation so that you can still see as normal. Now I'll position the eyeball so that you are looking directly at your brain proper. Picture this, if you will. You are looking at your brain right in front of you. Not through a mirror, mind you, but directly at your own brain. Never mind the horror of it, just relax and take a look at your brain. I'm afraid you won't be able to blink, so I'll kindly apply droplets of saline solution at regular intervals. And let's not get preoccupied with the technical details. The optic nerves aren't terribly long, so you will be looking at your brain from a very short distance away. Nevertheless, that pink mass of undulating tissue, covered in a spider web of pulsating blood vessels, looming before you is your brain. You are thus faced with the following question. Where are you? Are you here looking at your brain there before you? Or are you there in the brain that you are looking at from outside yourself? The whole of the brain is in view. It occupies space in front of your eyes. If your consciousness is inside the brain, then where are you now to contain it in your visual field? This little experiment is an illustration that everything which we see and feel, even our own body and brain, is an object in consciousness, not an object in the real world. There may be such a body and brain in the real world, but the one which you are looking at, the brain which you see with your own eyes cannot be you. You cannot be contained within yourself. If the brain is contained within you, in consciousness, then how can you be contained within your brain in objective reality? Each reality contains the other, does it not? Subjectivity is contained within objectivity from an objective point of view. This is the purview of science and this is the way we have learned to think about ourselves and the universe. But objectivity, as a construct of our reasoning, is necessarily contained within subjectivity and projected as a model of reality. The worldview which is intuitive to us is that we are located in space and time, and around us there are other things which we can observe. That we exist in an objective world might be the case, but it is entirely an inference. We make observations, true enough, but we make them of contents in our own minds. The observations are composed of consciousness, not of physical material. We normally think that the mind is an enigma, but in fact it is the world which is an enigma. It is said that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Perhaps in a manner of speaking this is so. But if so, then with each new conscious being, it is in their process of becoming that the heavens and the earth are recreated. If you and I were not here to witness this moment, this moment would not be. Mm -hmm.